to, to what extent have you guys looked into the work of Wilhelm Reich? Uh, I have looked into it. Um, not, not incredibly deeply, but I know the story. I know the idea. Okay. Tell the story. <laughs> the I don't know. He's the orgone. Uh, I think the orgone energy guy. Yeah. He's the orgone energy guy. Yes. Yeah. I have, I have gone down that rabbit hole a little bit. So you've gone down that. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's definitely a rabbit hole. Um, let's have a look okay. here. Um, That's yeah, the I'm question. not sure what that Can is. Can we build an orgone generator? Right. Well, you, you got several podcasts where the material there with Wilhelm Reich. That's right. <laughs> yeah, we do. We do. Yeah. But why, why are you connecting that to what we were just talking about? Like, that's what I want to know right now. Is this the vortex? No, stuff? this is the. Oh, that's what you want to know. Okay. Uh, what what brought that to your mind is what I'm trying to figure have you, out. Have you got the screen? Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Share screen. Okay. Uh, yeah, there he is being taken to prison for daring to use life force to heal people. Right. Yeah. Well, didn't he quote unquote he irradiated his entire property? That's why they were taking him to prison, right? They shut him down. That was what they said. No, well, it was actually the FDA. Oh, um, okay. FDA was trying to shut down his cancer, his cancer quackery, uh, as they called it. But the thing is, and, and there are still those who, who, who maintain, you know, oh, Wilhelm Reich was a total quack, right? Right. But interestingly, when the FDA was trying to solicit plaintiffs in a fraud case against uh, Reich, they went to dozens and dozens of his patients being treated by his methodology, and they couldn't find a single one to to sign on as a complainant because they all claimed they were being helped by the by the uh, the therapy that he was uh, doing. And so what they then had to do was they got him on contempt of court charge because they sent a letter. One of the courts, circuit courts, I believe, there in in Maine, uh, sent a letter to him claiming he had to cease and desist his treatments. And what he did was he wrote back to the court saying he wanted his methods to be judged by uh, a group of his scientific peers and not a, a bunch of lawyers. <laughs> and it was on the basis of that letter that they charged him with uh, contempt of court. Yeah. And this is after his arrest. This picture is his arrest for contempt of court. And agents uh, came out of the FDA and uh, to his laboratory in Rangeley, Maine. And they went into his laboratory and confiscated two truckloads of papers and took them and notes and books and, and research that he had done. Two truckloads, took those to an incinerator and had them burned oh, and went into his laboratory with sledgehammers and smashed all of his equipment. So that was what was going on in right. 1957. That's definitely so, what you do when you know that you're right about your, your case. Yeah. <laughs> you burn all of the <laughs> opposing Right. documents and smash all of these stuff right yeah because here we go here's the quote from judge john d clifford from a 1954 u.s court ruling in which all of dr reich's books and research journals were banned and ordered burned in incinerators reich was sent to a federal penitentiary where he died and this was the ruling of judge john d clifford the orgone energy does not exist or you might say the life energy does not exist. And so basically what you're doing is denying the traditions of, you know, dozens of cultures all over the world going back to the earliest recorded history that had some concept of a life energy or a bioenergy or some idea of a subtle force. So what, you, what you're doing here is you're throwing out that entire legacy by saying this, by saying that that the orgo, you're saying basically there is no such thing as life energy. And all of these cultures that, that have recognized life energy in one form or another were obviously all, you know, misguided and, and uneducated and pre-scientific illiterates. Yet what he was doing, I guess at the time, probably had to be shut down. You know, his, his son, Peter Reich, wrote a book, I think it was, came out in the 70s, called A Book of Dreams. And he talks about his last visit to, to, to Wilhelm in his cell on the eve of his being released. And Wilhelm told his son, Peter, that they would not let him out of his cell. They, they would not free him alive. And the day he was to be released, he was, by coincidence, found dead in his cell. Um, the autopsy report said it was heart failure. His heart failed. But, you know, um, 
pretty much. But of course, in most in cases time. where a person is murdered, their heart does fail. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. What What were they railroading him for? Like, what, what do you think they were really? Who was it? Who was behind the uh, destruction? Good question. I don't know. You know, other than the the overt one, which was the the, the Food and Drug Administration, um, who basically instigated all these proceedings against him. Right. I don't know. They were just by the time it got to his release from prison after two years, you know, who might have engineered that if, if it was in fact something other than a coincidence, it, listen, it may have been a coincidence because I have no evidence other than the fact that it is a bizarre coincidence right. that he not only told his son, this, his son recorded it in the book years later, but he did in fact die in his, in his prison cell. Right. So, um, well, as, as my favorite commentator, Malcolm Nance, Recent has, has repeatedly said, coincidence takes planning. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great quote. So can we build a generator, an Oregon generator, Andrew? Or is there not enough information remaining for us to do that? Because this is the first thing that Kyle and I always think of is like, okay, we're looking at these, these, um, these devices that people have supposedly come up with, and the first question is, is, can we make one? Well, take a look right here. Can you see my screen? I see it. Okay, now that's a simple one. That's an accumulator. And the key is in the layering in an orgone accumulator. Oh, steel wool, huh? Uh huh. Interesting. And fiberglass. See, that's it it's looks alter like alternating material. See, steel wool and fiberglass. Right. So you've got a metal and you've got a silicate. Uh, in some cases, they would use uh, an organic material and an inorganic material. Again, to create this dielectric, to create this right. um, this difference. Potential differences, yeah. Yes, yes, exactly. Like a capacitor type of thing? Yeah. What's that? It looks, looks like a capacitor. Like a capacitor. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Which, which has been found in some of the earthen mounds. Well, Brad, you're 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 jumping the gun there, Brad. But but yeah, I don't want I don't want to I don't I don't know when we're going to cut it off here, so I'm I'm learning well, about cl what, cliffhangers let's go for another couple of minutes, and then we'll call it call it for tonight. Uh, I was going to say it looked like something that you could wrap the shamir in to yeah, keep it safe. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so let's let's see let's learn a little bit about here these orgon accumulators. In 1940, Reich invented a way to concentrate the orgone energy. He constructed an orgone accumulator, a box whose walls, floor, and ceiling consisted of several layers of alternating organic and metallic material. Observations and experiments have shown that organic material attracts and collects orgone from the atmosphere, and that metallic material attracts and repels orgone. Thus, the organic layers of the accumulator attract and soak up orgone, and the metallic layers draw it from the organic material and radiate it into the interior of the accumulator. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, that was from Ola Rackness, uh, who published a book in 1970 called Wilhelm Reich and Organomy. He went on to say, a universal ubiquitous energy may be supposed to behave and to act according to its own inherent laws. In some cases, and further future knowledge may multiply them, the orgone energy can be directed and used for special purposes. The first application of orgone energy came with the construction of the orgone accumulator in its various forms. The accumulators are constructed to concentrate and irradiate orgone with the object of stimulating the natural functioning. A third application of the orgone energy is the cloud buster. I have already described how this can influence weather. If this apparatus could be more studied and used, in my opinion, it might be the greatest importance of all orgone devices, uh, and which I would have to concur with that. Um, in another work, Orgone, Reich, and Eros, Edward Mann, in 1973, said, in brief, the boxes which began as observation chambers were found to draw in orgone and eventually were labeled orgone accumulators. Experiments proved, and here's crucial, the greater the layering of the walls, the greater, up to a point, the concentration or amount of orgone. In time, accumulators of up to 20 layers were built. Now what is significant about that 
is quite simply uh, this. Here's a work, The Sphinx and the Megaliths, from John Ivamy, 1975. Um, and he's talking about Silbury Hill right here, famous uh, earthen mound in England, not far from where Graham Hancock lives, right? So he's describing the structure of Silbury Hill. He says, under excavating under the directions of Professor R.J.C. Atkinson in the last few years have revealed many details previously unknown about the methods used in the construction of Silbury Hill. That pyramid was not built in the way one might expect Stone Age aboriginals to have built it by simply digging a ditch and shoveling the material from it into a heap in the middle as children build sandcastles on the beach. Far from it. Silbury Hill was a complex piece of engineering involving advanced methods of construction similar to those used in the Egyptian pyramids. For the main part of the hill, the material dug from the ditch was laid systematically in horizontal layers, the outer edges of which were reveted by means of sloping retaining walls made by large blocks of chalk. Uh, and then we can jump across the ocean to the On the Mounds and Relics of the Ancient Nations of America, written in 1846, extracted from a letter by Dr. G.A. Mantell in the American Journal of Science, uh, published in 1846. I went and found the original work in which this was published, and I'll skip one page here because he's talking about mounds uh, and relics, um, the mounds of Ohio and Scioto Valley, and this is what they found when they were excavating that the merely sepulchral piles of our earth mounds thrown up at random without arrangement of the materials, but those covering altars were artificially stratified, layer over layer of alternating beds of gravel, earth, and sand, but following a common curvature like a series of caps drawn over the same head. We know not why the altars were covered with so much care or why covered at all, Probably the proceeding was interwoven with their religious notions. <laughs> uh, E.J. Squire, 1847, observations on the uses of the mounds of the West with an attempt at their classification. And this is what he points out as one of the most important aspects of these mounds is the fact of stratification in the mounds. It's one of great interest and importance. The feature has heretofore been remarked but not described with proper accuracy and has consequently proved an impediment to the recognition of the artificial origin of the mounds by those who have never seen them. The stratification, so far as observed, is not horizontal but always conforms to the convex outline of the mound. Wow. So I think here is a little bit of uh, food for uh, thought. Um, possibly we can see some correlations here. Yes. Um, if we're open to this kind of a thing, the point being is that on both sides of the ocean with only a cursory examination, we see that these earthwork structures bear a similar internal architecture. And this has to do with the layering and the stratification of alternative, alternative types of materials. And we found that was the basic principle behind the construction of an orgone accumulator. Correct? Correct. All right. So was there we are. Gobekli Tepe was also buried that same way. That's what I was going to ask. Yeah. Yeah. Is, is there stratification at Gobekli Yes, Tepe? it was stratified. And so it maybe was, it was supposed to, like, we're taking them apart? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, there we go. So, again, is this coincidence possibly that they were building these structures all over the planet and using the same kind of principles of astronomy, of geology, of, of engineering, of, you see, you can say that, those of us who are looking at these kind of things and hypothesizing that there was some unknown science or some unknown civilization that could have had uh, access to this kind of science, we're the ones who are being labeled as the fringe and the pseudoscientists and so on. And yet I look at it and I go, you've got a whole big group out there that basically is scared of looking at these alternative paradigms for whatever reason, psychological, emotional, whatever, or invested, uh, economic, whatever. They don't want to look at what's staring us in the face. And, and you cannot just cavalierly wave your arm and make this stuff go away because it ain't going away. We're just learning more and more how truly mysterious and deep the human past on planet Earth really is. And, and, and it ain't going away. In spite of the efforts of the, the debunkers and so on, it ain't going away. That's right. And like Mike said, coincidence takes planning. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it is a coincidence and it took planning. So 
we can <laughs> we're we're definitely be coming back to these themes uh, yeah. because there's obviously a whole lot more to this than we've talked about in a few minutes here tonight. That's right. Yeah. Now we have all the time in the world. That's we're going right. to keep publishing these podcasts, so we will we will be able to dive deep into every one of these subjects. Right, Randall? Uh, yeah, <laughs> whatever you say, Russ. <laughs>